Hi there, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to me to be here today. I'm Chiara Sigele, working at OBC TransEuropa, and I have the luck to be introducing the first episode of our short series uh, about the European Data Journalism Network. Um, I'm uh, the project coordinator, and today I'm here together with two colleagues, uh, Giampaolo Accardo, founder of Vox Europe, and Georg Folk Hi. of Eurologus, our Hungarian partner. Hi, Hi yes, Georg. I'm a co-founder. Hi I'm there. Co -founder. Hello, everyone. I'm also a co-founder of Eurologus since um, 2012. Great. So I'm very lucky to be here with these two special guests. And uh, our first episode today is... Um, is a chance to, to tell you about why we established the European Data Journalism Network and why uh, we believe that uh, data journalism provides a good uh, tool and strategy uh, to, to tell uh, European citizens about European stories. So um, it's uh, about uh, three years now since we embarked on this uh, little adventure. Um, so let me first tell you a few words about what the European Data Journalism Network is about. It's, it's a network of independent uh, news organizations. Um, uh, and uh, our motto is Europe explained through data. So um, we, we produce together, working in a collaborative way, um, stories that... Um, help uh, bring together different angles on the same topic from various uh, European contexts. And we also aim to promote data-driven co coverage of European topics in several languages. Mm. Our website is uh, europeandatajournalism.eu and we conceive ourselves as a collaborative community, as a platform when, where you can find uh, various uh, news by the over 30 partners of the network and also as a learning community because since the very beginning we uh, use the opportunity of EDGNet to test uh, new ways to do our job. Um, so I would like to start this conversation uh, with um, one, one question starting from Gianpaolo who is, if you allow me Gianpaolo, one of our oldest uh, friends, let's say, because when we started this, uh, this journey, it was the two organizations, OBC Trans Europa and Vox Europe, uh, having the idea uh, to, to try to bring together a group of, of newsrooms to, to, to take on this challenge to cover European affairs uh, in a hopefully innovative way. So, Gianpaolo, um, one first... Um, uh, question I would say for us is um, how, why, why do you believe that data journalism is a useful tool to, to approach European issues and to contribute to the building of a European public sphere? Do you feel it since we felt in the beginning that this is a way to go and uh, yeah, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, thanks, uh, Chiara, and thanks you all for, for remembering my age uh, <laughs> in terms of being old. So, um, to be honest, um, the importance of data journalism for telling Europe or ex trying to explain Europe uh, is not, um, let's say, it's not completely uh, uh, mine. I, I had a, a kind of enlightenment a few years ago when I was thinking about how to best tell what is happening in Europe to, um, let's say, to, to, yes, to the, the average European uh, news consumer or reader uh, in a way that wouldn't be too complicated, <clears throat> in a way that would help uh, explaining complex, complex issues, and in a way that would be understandable for the largest uh, possible number. And uh, uh, I had the, the, the chance to watch a, a, a conference, an online, it was already online at the time, where one of the first 
pioneers of data journalism in Europe, uh, Nicolas Kaiserbril, who also happens to be a contributor to European data journalism, uh, said that uh, probably instead of trying to translate long stories into different languages to explain how Europe works, um, using data and uh, uh, data journeys would be simpler because data uh, is understandable across languages. Visualizations are understandable across languages. And so uh, using data and data journalism would help um, Europeans, wherever they are and whatever their background is, to uh, understand more easily uh, complex issues uh, that are linked to a European affair, be it the EU or other uh, issues that are not linked to the EU. So when the, um, uh, when the call for a project uh, was issued by the Commission, to which uh, we ended up answering with uh, obesity, um, it, it seemed to me uh, the best possible opportunity to um, concretely uh, realize and implement what uh, Nicola Casabelli was saying and what I was also uh, thinking about for uh, quite quite a long time. So maybe let's start the diving a little bit deeper in the work we do. Um, so Gianpaolo, would you like to, to tell our listeners a little bit more about the way we, uh, we uh, aim at our uh, goal, meaning explaining Europe through, through data. Uh, so more or less, um, what sort of stories, how many stories you can find on our platform and um, how do we work together in the sense that uh, we have these 30 members, but of course not all of them work um, uh, all the time, all together. So maybe let's just give some hints on, on the way we work. And, and maybe if you wish also some of the stories that you really love to work on collaboratively with others uh, within the network. Okay, so when we set up this network back in, uh, uh, in the late 2016, uh, Chiara, if you remember, we, we had more or less two possibilities. Either go for very large partners, uh, very large news media in Europe, or uh, aim for small to medium-sized media, independent, uh, most of them, um, and we chose the second option because we thought it were it would be more uh, agile and also um, because we were uh, very much um, looking for uh, working in the most collaborative possible way uh, between partners. And for this, you need uh, people to spend a lot of time together virtually, most of the time, of course, um, and that's easier with the small to medium organizations, like uh, most of our 30 partners are, with, uh, of course, a few exceptions. And uh, um, so the purpose is to basically to produce alone or together in, in collaboration, um, translate and disseminate and share uh, stories on European affairs, um, stories that would look at European affairs through a data prism. This means uh, that the beginning of the story, the starting point should be uh, new, possibly new and fresh data on uh, whatever issue, although we have some uh, issues that we prefer to cover, and, and then develop the story afterwards. Uh, the issues we cover the most uh, are also linked to the, the sensibility uh, and the editorial line of our partners, but Basically, they run around um, uh, social issues, inequalities, uh, gender issues, the environment, energy, transportation, um, fundamental rights. And uh, uh, I'd say those are the, the, the main topics that, uh, that we cover. Um, and the idea is every time... Uh, a partner has an idea for a story uh, to reach out to the other partners and uh, ask them if they are interested in uh, jumping in, in uh, collaborating to the story. Uh, and if so, then they work in two, three or four or more people uh, on the same story, everyone with its own uh, uh, capacity and specialization. Uh, so to get the maximum possible um, 
uh, to take advantage of each one's speciality, specialization. Um, and so we, we were able to run all in all uh, some 600 stories uh, until now, which is, in my opinion, a fairly, <laughs> a fairly good achievement. Uh, of course, there are, uh, let's say, smaller stories with uh, less impact and maybe less, uh, that were less um, reused by partners. And then there are large investigations who uh, saw uh, many partners involved. Uh, some even, uh, almost all partners were involved. Um, I think about the, the large investigation that was led and coordinated by uh, Journalism Plus Plus Stockholm on the uh, change in temperatures in Europe over more than 100 years, or the investigation run lately by uh, Thivio, our Spanish partner, on uh, uh, mental health in Europe, um, where more than uh, 30 different people and organizations uh, took part to. So I'd say... There's a wide range of both topics, angles, type of uh, stories. Some have a lot of data set and of research in it. Others uh, are based on uh, already existing data sets. So I think one of the characteristics of the networks, of our network, is that it's flexible. Um, it able to focus on several topics uh, that are of interest of both partners and the public and uh, that it is also extremely uh, well uh, uh, connected. I mean, we are also happy to work together, uh, after all, which is a, a major driver for this kind of effort. I like very much the idea of happiness as a driver <laughs> in life. So, uh, moving to you, Georg, what, what's your perspective? Um, we we are a happy that... partner. <laughs> good, good to hear. Um, so, I mean, what, what did um, uh, attract you uh, and Eurologus to become a member of EDGNet? And what's, in your view, the added value that such a network of newsrooms and, and uh, small to medium media, with the few exceptions uh, that uh, Gianpaolo mentioned, that uh, what's the added value that it brings to your everyday work and to the impact of your stories and maybe also uh, to the service that we would like to bring to, to the European citizens' community? What's your perspective? So thank you for the question, Chiara. Um... We are part, Eurolo, which is partners um, with EDGNet since uh, third year. I think it's going to be the third period uh, um, starting in April. We, we cooperate with you guys. And originally we came uh, to this, um, this cooperation um, uh, primarily because we, we thought that um, cross-border cooperation is really beneficial for us. But this, um, this perception has... Uh, since then evolved to the better because we well, there are multiple layers of of benefits for us for for um, taking part and that's why for from uh, from next from the next period we will be a core member too is that uh, one thing is that we have a special focus we are a hungarian publication but we are primarily produced from brussels so we have a very strong eye on the european affairs and a special focus on eu and that's how we even though we are published on HVG, which is one of the uh, largest news sites in Hungary, independent, still independent, I have to underline three times. Um, um, and um, what when we started, we thought that um, we we have two benefits that we will be able to to um, dedicate more time and. Um, journalistic work to um, to uh, data analysis and and covering stories based on data which is still the case but what we what we ever since understood is that our perception about stories and the way we uh, per perceive uh, different issues uh, given our special Brussels focus and being focused on the other hand on the output end to the Hungarian media market gives us benefits through the through this cooperation that is that is really interesting so we can often tell stories that otherwise do, would not come into our focus and would not be uh, 
surfacing in our weekly editorial meetings. And then we say something like, um, let's say, the, for, for us, a big surprise was, for example, Laszlo made this story about the, the, the sizes of forested areas in different countries in Europe. And we thought, like, well, it's not a super interesting story, story but for, for a reason, it's really running since then regularly. Even still, there are readers on it, and now we are re-promoting it, and that's a good example of where even we are surprised. Or Laszlo is really into um, writing stories about the penitentiary system and the justice system of, uh, of uh, different countries, and he made a story about... Uh, uh, murder cases in Europe and uh, suicides and uh, this data visualization excites people for example or um, a third story was about uh, prison populations that we were not expecting that it's really exciting and people are exciting about those and uh, when we we are able to cooperate with uh, Jean Paolo also mentioned this uh, mental health story that Laszlo also contributed from from our side uh, these are the the things where we with little insights from other countries and uh, journalists from other member states give us some impetus and then we we are just like have this aha moment and then we starting to work on a, a new story that that otherwise would not come into the picture and it's not always just the hardcore cooperation itself but the way we think about stories and the way we follow the what's what's published on the indigenous site or how our stories are taken over uh, i mean uh, republished uh, or translated that also like the, the translation part is also benefit it's it's a super added value for us that sometimes we we are able to see our stories in spanish or italian or french uh, translated or english uh, so um, there are more and more layers like in of an onion that are um, showing up slowly through the time and uh, for now uh, what we for our biggest um, hope for the next period is that we will be able to to live up to the expectation of what we can bring with our Brussels presence, permanent Brussels presence, and uh, and that we will somehow be a little bit of a router for information from Brussels for the other members of the of the cooperation. I hope I did answer your questions, Chiara. Thank you. <laughs> yes, perfectly, and you actually opened up uh, <clears throat> opened up more. Uh, more insights of the work we do, uh, also mentioning the fact that um, uh, EDGNet uh, is a multilingual platform, so we uh, publish all the content produced by members for the network in English, of course, but we also have uh, uh, other 10 um, language edition, including Hungarian. <laughs> of course, mm -hmm. we do not have the uh, strength to translate all the materials in the various languages, but um, we also believe that uh, multilingualism is uh, indeed a very important uh, component uh, for journalism, European journalism, if we, we aim to reach out to European citizens as close as possible to their local reality and, and real life, let's say. Um, I would like to then uh, move again to, to Gianpaolo because um, uh, Vox Europe is our, um, let's say, Vox Europe together with OBCT is the editorial coordinator of the network at such. And from my point of view, it's interesting to observe uh, two kind of impacts that EDGNet is having. On one hand, uh, what also Georg just told us, meaning the um, impact on the organization itself. It's really something we had hoped for, and it's so nice to see it uh, becoming reality day after day. And uh, I mean, really trying to buy the um, collaboration that uh, we we try to um, practice every day, the way each of our organization does its journalism changes a little bit, both in terms of impetus, as Georgi said, uh, and also maybe in some cases in terms of um, um, techniques that are used. And then and this, is, this was something that we really um, had, uh, had in mind when we started. And the question to Gianpaolo is, to your um, perception, to your, what's your opinion in terms of uh, um, how far did we go in uh, changing a little bit the way that uh, members uh, approach European affairs? Um, I, I remember I want also to, to share, to remind you and also to let the uh, listeners know that um, 
uh, one year ago, more or less, we, we did a survey among our members to uh, survey among our members and not only, uh, actually it was an open survey, to try to understand uh, if the services that we were providing were of benefit to, to the journalistic community in Europe. And one question was also about uh, um, how much did uh, the work that we were doing um, uh, helped uh, newsrooms to deal with uh, European affairs in a regular way. And to our surprise, uh, it was only a minority of the respondents that, um, um, that declared that uh, they deal with European affairs on a regular basis. So now my question to you, Gianpaolo, would be, uh, do you think um, uh, that experiences like Ibiginet or even just Ibiginet, because we can just uh, yeah, talk about our own experience, have an impact on the way that uh, uh, newsrooms, um, uh, on the way that newsrooms cover uh, stories, and also on the way they um, they think of European affairs, um, and if so, in which way? Um, well, to to my experience, uh, until now, is that. Um, hmm. Let's say that at Edigenet we produced stories about European affairs in a wide uh, in a wide way. It's not only EU strictly affairs, but uh, also, as I mentioned earlier, society and uh, uh, stuff that is less related to the uh, European Union itself. Um, with regards to the, the second type of, uh, of stories, partners were happy because they are always uh, happy to deal with um, issues that are not too political and, and, uh, and too technical. Um, and in this regard, they had the opportunity to get more sources, uh, more uh, features uh, that they could cover, and more angles thanks to the um, contribution of uh, the, the network and the other partners. With regards to the EU, I would say that uh, EU, EU affairs strictly are often seen as uh, boring or arid for uh, most of newsroom, uh, not only in Europe, but across the world. And what we maybe provided uh, to our partners with the network and also to um, not only the network st partners, but also the, the, the media that we had uh, uh, contacts with and whom uh, reused uh, the material that we produced, um, they were a bit less afraid of talking about EU affairs, also because uh, through, especially because it was through data and through the comparisons between countries that data uh, allows to do in, in a very uh, immediately understandable way, uh, they were happy to, to cover EU affairs in a way that is not boring or too technical. So when when you have uh, when we produce a map or an explanatory or an infographics that shows the, the comparison on, on topics such as youth and employment or uh, cultural consumption in different EU countries, uh, and this data is also is provided by uh, the EU um, statistical office, uh, it's something that most of uh, media are happy to use um, because it's not too technical, it's visibly very easy to understand and um, it's something their readers uh, are happy with because it gives them an overview on the other countries uh, around Europe um, which they wouldn't get with a classical uh, type of reporting that would limit itself to a few countries. Thank you, Gianpaolo. And uh, <clears throat> um, well, um, of course, this is not a problem for Eurologus, since you have European affairs at the very heart of your editorial mission, I'd say. Editorial DNA, and, yeah. <laughs> yes, but um, what about uh, is somehow Edigenet also uh, an opportunity for you to try to either bring Europe closer to Hungarian citizens and on the other way, to bring Hungary closer or to 
um, also, um, yeah, um, bring Hungary closer to a European audience. Have you ever considered your work under this perspective or is something that you think um, is part of your presence and benefit in, in the network? Uh, I think, yeah, this is a two-way uh, street. So what we do is because of the financial um, opportunities that the network gives us and because of the network opportunities, and also sometimes even the tool or just the, the way of thinking that that was brought aboard with the VDGNet in Eurologus, uh, we can uh, st and 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 jump out. I can only underline what Jean Paolo said that uh, the way um, stories are neutralized a little bit or or taken from a more distant perspective when it comes to cross-border stories or data-driven stories helps people to say this is not some EU policy boring uh, uh, or very um, very professionally relevant only professionally relevant topic but but yeah I can just say um, for example we had a story just out of my mind about um, corruption in sports. And I, 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 I'm certain that this is, just, we came with, up with this story just because we are in this network. Otherwise, we would not do this story. And it was loved by our audience. And then it was even taken over by other uh, publications because it's it's interesting because we speak, speak about, it's like a rubber stamp saying that oh yeah there is big corruption in sports and especially in sports betting and the way uh, matches are are cheated and so on and so forth but we never we never hear data about that and what we did in this case is that we got a data set we and we underlined the argument with real with reality and this is just one example of the way we sometimes uh, bring in the idea and support it with hard data or facts uh, through the through the means of um, EVGNet, and then we we are able to to uh, uh, produce those, and then get, it gets translated, and it can get visibility outside Hungary. So that's one way. And the other way around is that um, sometimes we have stories um, that we think for the Hungarian audience are relevant, and then we say we will support them with arguments from outside Hungary. So, or we give other examples. We can show that, yeah, this is not a good practice. It can be done in 10 other ways or five other ways. And two of them are much better in other member, st member states of the EU. And that way we can also give some external reflection on often very dull or dull or a very uh, sad um, processes or, or, uh, or uh, flows of, uh, uh, th things in Hungary or politics, not just politics, but other things too, but like in, even in healthcare or other things where you can just give ac external examples and it helps people to understand that, that this is not the only way to deal with the thing. And, um, and that's where we find, um, our cooperation here useful to, to bring an external mirror, so to say to the Hungarian audiences. And that, that comes also time to time. Uh, and then, um, our, our Brussels presence underlined with data. I mean, actually, this is a luxury here. We in Brussels, we have a lot of data. Uh, very often we have reports. There's no, basically almost, I would say in an average, every second weekly meeting we have, editorial weekly meeting, we have a new idea of, of ah, I saw a database on that. There's a new Eurostat on that. There is a Eurobarometer on that. There is a, I heard about, uh, I just got an insider Excel sheet from the European Commission that we could use. And these kind of thinkings are always empowered by the fact that we are part of this network and uh, we cannot be grateful enough. I mean, it's not in the sense, but in the really honest and really useful and beneficial sense. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, oh, back and forth. Uh, it's back and nice. forth. Yeah. Thank you, Georg. And uh, speaking about data, it's true that, um, of course, Eurostat and many other European agencies um, provide a lot of data. Uh, but I'd like to uh, widen a little bit the scope to, to also uh, tell another aspect of the work that we have started to do, meaning looking for very local data to um, root European uh, to root stories at the local level, stories that, um, or to root phenomena 
uh, that are much uh, bigger, that are global phenomena, be it uh, the global warming, but also other issues with um, a very local dimension. And uh, um, and here, I don't know, John Paolo, if you want to provide some examples of, of these um, of these attempt of ours, or um, um, provide some context why we believe that this is also another way to go. So not just remaining on data at the local or at the European level, but trying to go uh, deeper and closer to to the local um, layers, let's say, of our experience. Yeah. Hmm. Sure. Well, of course, uh, as I was saying earlier, um, Europeans like to make comparisons between countries, but at the same time, they are very much rooted in their own city, in their own, uh, uh, in their own region, in their own local uh, community and environment. So they also are uh, very much interested in uh, in local news, like. I mean, uh, like everyone. Um, the problem is that often their local news sources uh, don't have access to, uh, let's say, uh, data or news uh, from th that go all, um, that go beyond the the national uh, perimeter. Um, and so, what we uh, what we did at uh, Edigenet was trying to. Uh, at some point, trying to go as uh, much local as possible, uh, knowing that we are uh, rather uh, also centralized newsroom, um, and, and so uh, we decided that every time, every time it is possible, uh, to try to have uh, as granular as possible uh, data. Uh, so as to be able to go to the, the, the as closest as possible to citizens, and also because this allows us to partner uh, with the local news organizations. And uh, we had the first exper experience with uh, the um, Europe One Degree Warmer project, uh, that was a large uh, inve investigation um, on uh, the, the change of in temperatures in uh, more than. Uh, uh, more than 500 cities uh, around Europe, and we, uh, once this uh, investigation was ready, uh, we contacted local newsrooms, asking them if they were interested in the, um, getting the results and access to the data uh, with regards to their um, uh, to their own uh, region and and. Uh, and, and cities, and so we, and of course they were because those data they were they were not able to to fetch this data by themselves. So they were very happy to get this data, and they uh, they wrote their own stories based on the data that uh, Edigenet provided. Uh, the same uh, went with the story, another story on the um, uh, the proximity, the accessibility to uh, railroads. Uh, for um, a European, how far is the the closest station to a um, railroad station to uh, every citizen, and uh, and so on. And every time, uh, local uh, news organizations are happy to uh, partner with the Diginet uh, because they get access to material that otherwise they wouldn't get. Um, so this allows us to. Um, to, um, to match two of our main goals. One is widening uh, the, the number of partners, and the other one is trying to get as close as possible to um, the European citizens. Um, and so I, I think uh, everyone is happy with um, this kind of, of partnership, and I think we, we did a good service to um, citizens and news from across Europe. Yeah, if I can just add something, you don't mind? Please go ahead. Is that uh, uh, often when, um, I mean, from a local journalist's perspective, if you have a story that uh, we say, let's say we, we process uh, together or somebody processes a data set, and let's say it comes a Europe-wide map out of it, and which can be browsed then for different data elements on different regions or countries, then... Uh, 
what what we allow through this network is that if somebody from a local media or so local organization uh, media organization wants to tell a story of from that local angle then he or she doesn't has have to uh, restart the whole work again but there is already a pre chewed data set or a map that is ready or other visualization that they can rely on and then from that they can tell their own story for their own local or regional relevant audience and through these ways uh, the same story is basically st- told in or, or localized in many many uh, could be localized in many many regions of Europe by the core the essence is always or it can be the same so one data set or one map of the data set visualization of a, a data set and so on and so forth and these are the benefits that are th- these are things that are not just benefits these are uh, uh, quasi services that we we can give to journalists uh, who are otherwise who have otherwise no time or capacity to to process such a big uh, set of data and especially not on such a frequency so when if once they can do it but we give we give the means and the the, the possibilities and even the tools sometimes to to do this uh, uh, be beforehand and then other people can use it or other media and i think these are excellent uh, ways of uh, uh, boosting the coherence of European public sphere, which is we all know is super fragmented, partly um, primarily because of, I mean, not just because of language barriers, but p- primarily because of language barriers and also because of the low level of of, uh, of uh, incentives through member states or through national governments who, who really are keen to push this. Because it's honestly, it's really a small fraction of European countries who want to see this European public sphere more vivid because it will bring them more criticism, more reflection, more um, reactions and more honest and more independent observatory. And they need it, badly need it. And primarily who really needs it is us, the five, 450 million European citizens who are who should be keen to do this. But most of us don't even think about it because it's so far away what happens in Italy or Spain or Finland from a Hungarian point of view. Thank you, Gorgi, for this uh, excellent integration. And um, um, I really think that um, this is what we wished in the very beginning. And uh, the tools that we equipped our team to do so uh, are, on one hand, as you were saying, uh, data analysis uh, and really conceiving the work that we do within the network as something in the service of of others. then also uh, trying to boosting syndication of opportunities, both for members within the network and mm. for news organization outside the network. Um, and here maybe, uh, Gianpaolo, you can tell uh, a little bit about the different licenses that, that uh, we apply. And, and then it is very core, the idea uh, of uh, Um, enabling other newsroom to tell their own stories. I think that this is uh, one of the lessons learned that we really built on over the years. So, Gianpaolo, if you want just to um, provide a brief um, uh, overview of the various uh, um, licenses that we apply. Thanks, Chiara. Yeah, well, basically, uh, European Data Journalism Network does the contrary of what uh, traditional uh, newsroom uh, do. Uh, We share what we do. Uh, We are happy when others uh, reuse our material without uh, paying. And uh, we uh, we provide them with the free material, uh, knowing that usually um, news organizations are very cautious about uh, sharing and they, they want uh, to keep uh, the, the fresh material they get by themselves. Um, so everything that you would fi- will find on uh, European Data Journalism uh, .eu, the, the web platform that hosts uh, all the content that, and all the articles that are provided uh, and co-produced by the, the network and also the tools that we, uh, uh, that we make available to the journalistic community are uh, usable for free under the uh, Creative Commons um, Attribution 4.0 International. This means that 
uh, news organizations are free to share, to transform, and to build upon them for any purpose. Uh, although there are a few articles that are only on under royalty-free uh, copyright, uh, but this is an opt-in from uh, uh, the members. Uh, and anyway, any, every article has a mention of uh, the, the, the specific license under which it is uh, syndicated. So this is, let's call it the passive syndication, meaning you, you come on EDGNet website and uh, you can pick stories that you're interested in. But then we also have uh, what I would call active syndication, meaning that uh, we also um, knock on the door of uh, media that are not part of uh, the network and we propose them um, the stories that we've been producing, um, um, advertising some way the stories uh, and, and the material available, especially data sets, uh, telling them this is uh, something new, fresh, you can do your own stories uh, on this. Uh, and we also provide help with uh, uh, handling the, the data. So we act on uh, basically uh, those two levels. Uh, the only, um, let's say that the only condition apart from, uh, of course, respecting um, the uh, the license uh, is that uh, they have to credit uh, EDGNet for uh, for the stories uh, or the material, and they, they have to add uh, when possible the EDGNet's logo. Thank you, Gianpaolo. Um, I think that. Um, we, we provided a sort of overview uh, and also some of the reasons why we really love working together and we will be working together for another two years. So maybe we can just um, close this first episode by uh, relaunching the website edgnet uh, european data journalism .eu, and also invite the listeners who are willing to learn more of, of our work and maybe uh, get some inspiration to also visit our Medium page where we provide um, uh, tutorials and, and uh, hints how to methodologically uh, re, uh, redo the work, reuse the data or, or question the work we did because we are also trying to be transparent as uh, for the processes that we followed so that uh, we can uh, do it better. Um, and then and, and be trusted for, for the work that we have been doing. So thank you very much to both of you, Gianpaolo and Georg. Uh, talk soon within our EDGNet meetings. And till next time, goodbye. Thank you for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me.